Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly program in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, any part of their past or their present. And I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, also known for my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my three regulars on the show, that being from Beatles Examiner, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And two of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine. We've got Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken, and hello, everyone. And we've also got Al Sussman. Hello, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello, everybody. And on uh, today's program, we've got another, we've got a special guest, the same special guest that we had last week. And that is Darren DeVivo, who does the night shift on New York's WFUV. Hi, Darren. Hello, everyone. And I thought you were going to refer to me as an irregular because you guys are the regular <laughs> hosts. Our irregular host is Darren. Abby, Abby Normal. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Well, you're a semi regular then. Okay. All right. That works for me. On the program this time, I thought we'd talk about something that uh, I think would be a fun topic. Every now and then, I come across an article online from someone writing in about Beatles songs that are not as well known or not as popular, that we should all know articles of that sort. I think we've all come across those kind of articles. So I thought that I would ask each of the guys on our panel here to name three Beatles songs that, in their estimation they feel are either underrated or underappreciated. So I'm sure that everybody who listens to this program probably has some favorite songs of theirs that are not as well known. They're not in the upper echelon of Beatles songs. So that's what this show is all about, for us to talk about songs that we feel should be given some kind of special notice for the reasons we're about to give. So who would like to start? Let's, um, let me pick uh, Al. Okay. Um, now, uh, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. We are just talking about Beatles group songs, right? Yes, this time out. Okay. And uh, which, is, which is very challenging because obviously with, as I call it, the Rolls Royce of pop music catalogs, it's, it's tough to imagine uh, songs that are actually you know, underrated or unsung or underappreciated, but actually there are, there are some, which uh, especially these days where other than uh, specialized Beatles programs, you really don't hear some of these uh, all that much, or if you do, they just kind of, you know, sort of pass, uh, pass into the ether in, in a sense. The first one that I that I selected is um, is a song that was kind of um, buried twice, in effect, once on Beatles Six when that was released in June of sixty five, and then two months later when it was put on the uh, the second side of the British Help album, and it's uh, it's called "Tell Me What You See." Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's an interesting. It's it's very interesting in that it's it kind of signals the the kind of the experimental direction that they would begin to really go in on Rubber Soul. You know, for instance, the um, uh, the harmonies, and I'll uh, I'll defer to our uh, our resident musician, musicologist, Mr. Cozen, the harmonies are very unusual. They're not the normal, um, even though they are Lennon-McCartney harmonies, they're not the usual kind of Everly Brothers-esque Lennon-McCartney harmonies. They're, um, uh, they're a little off, um, you know, out of the norm. And they're, uh, and they're also, and even the, the melody, is even a little bit, uh, especially on, on those, on the, particularly the chorus, the, um, the verses, particularly the, uh, the melody is definitely unusual for Lennon McCartney songs of that, uh, of that period. And, uh, you know, the lyrically, it's really more of a, you know, a typical, you know, love song, but it's, uh, but it is, it is unusual. Even the and even the instrumentation, because uh, organ is really the uh, the predominant uh, instrument 
on the track, or perhaps a harmonium, uh, rather than you know, rather than guitar. So that's mm-hmm. s- certainly uh, certainly one of them. Uh, Alan, would you in- agree on that? As far as yeah, basically, was- it, 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 yeah, 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 you know, yeah. I think you're fine. I think that I think what you're hearing in the harmonies there is um, normally when they have harmonies going they tend to harmonize in the sense of they're actually singing different lines that Mm -hmm. that fit together and then tell me what you see they're sort of singing parallel lines you know Ah. they're they're singing basically the same melody at a different interval so it it sounds almost um i mean it's the kind of harmony that was used sometimes in medieval times you know you would you would hear basically the top line with a, a lower harmony or vice versa and and they're doing that there but yeah okay so what's the second okay the second one and uh, one would think how on earth can a song from the most famous album certainly the most famous album the beatles ever made and you know arguably the most famous album in pop music history be underappreciated but uh fixing a hole actually is it's not one of the more celebrated tracks from Sgt. Pepper, not in the way that with a little help from my friends uh, or certainly the songs that John Lennon brought to uh, uh, brought to that album. His were, were much more celebrated, but fixing a hole really it has the it has the elements of the you know the typical classic McCartney song. You know the uh, the the, the uh, earworm type of type of hook, the the kind of bouncy poppy feel, but lyrically it's kind of in in sync with the sort of quote unquote semi psychedelic uh, mood of of much of the album. You know, uh, uh, painting a room in a colorful way, and when my mind is wandering. There I will go. Uh, it's definitely different from "Got the Kitchen into My Life." Let's put it that way. So I would say mm-hmm. that that's probably uh, certainly one of the more uh, underappreciated songs, certainly from that album. And then the third one is um, a song that we probably didn't really learn to appreciate until much later. Um, Obviously, when we were, when those of us who were from the first generation of fans were uh, were kids, the George Harrison's Indian flavored tracks were not exactly uh, favorites. Certainly, the the three main ones, "Love You Too" on Revolver, uh, of I'm blanking out um, on "Within You Without You." Within You Without You, thank you, from Sergeant Pepper, and the one I'm uh, dealing with here, uh, the inner light, which was the uh, the the B side of the single of Lady Madonna in the spring of 1968, and it was I, actually I think even then it was probably cl- a little closer to uh, what uh, what the you know the pop audience of that time appreciated, but still it wasn't until uh, probably quite a bit later when we when our musical tastes began to really kind of mature that we were able to appreciate it um, and especially the treatment of it in the concert for George really has um, uh, I think that, that gave a lot of us a, a new appreciation as in fact um, has the uh, the instrumental treatment of it, the, the the instrumental background of it that was released uh as part of the um uh the the, the Wonder Wall music uh C D with the 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 new uh Apple Years George Harrison box. So um and 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 lyrically also it's certainly reflective of his uh his emerging Hindu philosophy. So and and plus when you uh, especially when you listen to the the instrumental track of it, uh, it's it's a very beautiful melody. So I think that's if if only because it's one of those um, Indian flavored tracks that George did as a Beatle. It's certainly an underappreciated track. So those are my three nominees. 
I applaud mm. your choice of the inner light. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. Now, now I feel yes. bad I didn't pick it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a comment about the Please. inner light or, or, or two? <laughs> Please. I love the inner light. I, I think it's a beautiful song, and it's it's a great choice. And I thought of um, choosing it myself, um, apart from that. Naturally, I came up with three much quirkier <laughs> songs. Um, but about the inner light, the funny thing about it is really that it's it's uh, George's first appearance on a single, and it is a completely purloined song in a lot of ways. I mean, mm -hmm. the lyrics, um, while those of us listening um, when we were younger would have thought of it as uh, reflecting George's Hindu interests it yeah. actually is a buddhist text yeah <laughs> it comes completely from lao tzu uh and it was from a translation that was sent to george by someone named juan mascaro who um had had compiled uh a bunch of not not just lao tzu but a bunch of eastern texts and sent george the book and George took the lyrics with with very little change. And let's face it, they were totally public domain, given that they were allowed to. Sure. Um, and then went to India, where he was working on Wonderwall and got a group of musicians to basically do the backing track. And, and the question mm -hmm. is whether, OK, we know that the lyrics weren't really his. I mean, he, he took them and shaped them and made them into his lyric but um the question is what the music is did did he actually have you know any tune input or anything like that into the music mm. or or was mm. he just listening to what the indian musicians were doing and then fitting it to to this lyric but whatever it is you know the finished product really is quite beautiful yes. um i've always loved that song and um and good choice but that just wanted to provide that textual footnote. Oh, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Do you remember, does anyone remember the very first time that they uh, flipped the Lady Madonna single over and played the inner light? Your, uh, I do. As, as, you know, your, wh what you thought as a, as a young boy hearing this for the first time. Mm -hmm. I remember it very well. Uh, and it was because uh, I had not been a fan of either Love You Too or uh, Within You, Without You. You know, I just found them, you know, just not very interesting musically. And I just, I found that the, um, that the melody of The Inner Light was a little, uh, a little more accessible than the other two had been. Which is interesting mm -hmm. because, I mean, now Within You, Without You, I consider one of the most beautiful songs <laughs> in the entire Beatles catalog. Mm. But, you know, I guess that's just a matter of, uh, you know, getting uh, in a more mature taste. But, yeah, on that first listen, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was certainly still, you know, strange to hear the the Indian instrumentation. But it was it was a little bit more accessible than um, than the other two. You know, given that what we had heard until then was, you know, Love You Too and Within You and Without You, mm -hmm. um, the inner light was a lot livelier. Yes. And it was a lot shorter. Mm -hmm. And the lyrics, which I, I mean, I had no idea at the time where the lyrics came from, but right. they seemed really kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that... Um, if I don't really remember the first time I listened to it, but I, I'm sure that if there was any trepidation left over from from you know think, assuming it might be like within you without you, I think just playing the record sort of dispelled that pretty quickly. It 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 just seems sort of like a normal Beatles song, except with Indian instruments. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always thought the the melody sounded just beautiful, even as a little kid listening to it and. Um, you know, kind of like if you want to say it's more commercial than the other Indian tracks, mm -hmm. um, certainly much more than Within You Without You. And um, mm -hmm. very easy to remember the lyrics because he repeats them. Yeah, and right. by the time yeah. by the time that the song's done, it just seems like it's like so many of their their singles that they're very short and you want to hear it again. So, uh, no, I always found the, the melody to be just exquisite. And the way that George sings it is just uh, I love his vocals on it. And uh I found it very easy to take in, even as uh, 
I would have been eight or nine then. Mm. So, uh, yeah, no, I love the song very quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, instrumental boy, ba- so. the, in- the instrumental background on that is wonderful. That yes, is, it is. And you, I, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Any other comments about Al's other suggestions? I know, Darren, you like the, uh, his choice. Being fixing a hole was that a surprise for anybody? Um, no, um, yeah. When I when I heard the inner light, my first reaction was, "Oh, that should have been one of mine." That would <laughs> that definitely. I mean, if there's a three B in my list, that it would be the inner light. Right. Mm. Yeah. All right. Who wants to go next? How about you, Darren? Okay. Um, first one is another jaw. Actually, of my three. Uh, of my three songs, there are two George Harrisons, and up first is "It's All Too Much," hmm. um, mm-hmm. and it to me it is just in its six plus minutes everything glorious uh, about the entire uh, psychedelic thing that was going on at that time. And it was the Beatles once again hitting a home run in, in, in capturing this, you know, multicolored uh, liquid light show paisley psychedelic image um, from the feedback at the beginning and uh, and uh, the organ, the Ringo's drums, the, the way it fades out <laughs> at the end. It's just an explosion of of color and there's no way you can not listen to it's all too much and just not in your mind have this incredibly incredible psychedelic thing uh happening i don't i you know i don't i I was i was five when they broke up so i picked up on a lot of stuff after the fact and uh, i realized much later uh, in life that not counting the movie Yellow Submarine, which was mid-68, when the album Yellow Submarine comes out in January 69, how kind of out of place uh, the Beatles songs on that album were in comparison to where they were musically, that these mm-hmm. were already old songs. It was a been there, done mm-hmm. that thing for the Beatles. It's all oh, too yeah. much. You know, mm-hmm. to me, it was like, Wow what another great song and it fit alongside uh, whatever rubber soul track I was discovering maybe at that time in the, by the mid seventies, early seventies, whenever. So it's all too much has always been my uh, incredible orgy of Beatle psychedelia. Um, I mean, I, I just love listening to that loud, very loud. Mm. Oh yeah. Good choice. Good mm-hmm. choice. In a way, I kind of wish they had done more of that. Actually, you know, and 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 and, and to some extent, I maybe I it, it could be considered. A th- I almost picked it's only a northern song, mm-hmm. uh, but I thought, all right, I can't take them both. Let me take one of the two. I think it's all too much. Has all similar qualities uh, to it in the you know maybe the length thing. Hey Jude, it's all too much. Long fade outs. It just mm. seemed to sum everything up that was Sgt. Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour, and Yellow Submarine in six minutes. And mm-hmm. uh, there's also something about that, the, one of the last lines in the song, and your, uh, with your long blonde hair and your eyes of blue for Patty is just, mm-hmm. I don't know, mm-hmm. just, just that line is... Although, uh, of course, he, they, he stole that he, line from... From the, Sorrow. Uh, from Sorrow, yep. right? Yeah. Oh, Okay. So that's number one for me. It's all too much, although I should say maybe these are in no particular order. Number two is uh, another George song, which initially was a B-side, and I discovered it with on the Hey Jude album, which was one of my first Beatle albums I ever owned and might have been the first one that I actually asked for when I walked by the record store and said, I want that, and that's Old Brown Shoe. Mm. Mm-hmm. The thing that I love about Old Brown Shoe is McCartney's bass. Mm-hmm. on that song i mean i'm like uh uh i mean going back to last week's show paul is sort of my favorite beetle and when uh i mean i just can't get over the bass lines in that song i don't know Darren? what the song's about yes yeah um george actually said that it was he that played the bass on that song that's pretty really i didn't yeah. know that and if that's the case then 
Uh, it's too bad George didn't play some more bass uh, <laughs> because that's that's a killer line on that song. Yeah. And it's just one of those ones. Maybe I think Old Brown Shoe also benefits. I'm sure we all have our Beatles songs that are classics, but we're a little, a little tired of hearing maybe a hit. Uh, that you might hear on the oldies stations a little too much. Mm. So I'm always like uh, jumping over to something like something like Old Brown Shoe, a tune that you won't hear on the radio. But uh, wow, George played bass on that. See you. Well, he he said that in Cream Magazine around the time when Cloud Nine came out. You learn mm-hmm. something new every day. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. So so Paul plays the piano part. Um, right. I think. Didn't I Not was that, that would have precluded him from playing the bass, but all right. But in any of any event, even if it's uh, even if it's Ken playing bass, uh, <laughs> Old Brown Shoe remains in my list. It's just I just think it's a great song, uh, just a great song that just kind of something has to get full through the cracks, and uh, that did. And um, my last one is I'll Follow the Sun. Mm. Um, not the type of song that you tend to hear on the radio all that often but to me i'll follow the sun holds its weight alongside other classic acoustic based beatles songs like uh and well-known ones like oh maybe norwegian wood trying to think of another one of that era that you'll you'll hear on the radio a lot but i'll follow the sun a little earlier than that actually the norwegian wood Uh, i'll follow the sun to me it was always a, a beautiful perfect melody it's just a great uh sentiment it just really uh i remember hearing it for the first time i think was when i got the love songs album uh that's when i discovered it for the first time and uh it's always been a favorite of mine from that point to today and it's interesting because that's actually one of paul's earliest songs i'll follow the sun wow yeah yeah that's true that's true yes Yep. If you listen, there's the the bootleg of the Quarrymen rehearsing yes. it, mm-hmm. and the yeah. interesting thing of uh, the interesting part about that is is that the song is much longer, and there's other sections of the song, mm. which obviously Paul felt, rightfully so, needed to be taken out. So uh, it worked much better as a shorter piece. So it's always interesting to hear whether it's the Beatles anthology or on Beatle bootlegs, songs that are not complete that are missing part of what eventually they released. On their on their recordings, mm. or when they had when they had parts of of a song that they later didn't use, which was the case of "I'll Follow the Sun." So, right. But um, and also I, as I, a as a, a footnote to to Darren's first choice, um, it's all too much. There's a verse on the Yellow Submarine movie soundtrack that is mm. not in the finished recording. So it's, yes, it's that's another right. one of those things, sort of like what you were saying. Yep. I'd love to hear the whole unedited track you know love to be a fly on the wall in the studio when they were doing the uh too much chance and how long that went on yeah. for and how what mm. kind of silliness that kind of ended up going in what direction that went mm-hmm. yeah i'll never forget uh seeing the remastered yellow submarine in the castro theater in san francisco and getting to that getting to uh that song at the end it was uh, it was absolutely mind blowing to see it in in vivid color i mean in the the remastered vivid color and then mm-hmm. uh on the on that big screen with the stereo speakers on both sides it was uh, it was amazing and to think that they recorded something like it's all too much on what today is viewed as primitive mm-hmm. recording equipment and oh, that's yeah. what they I, came, and that's what they came up with I always marvel at that, that, you know, Sergeant Pepper was recorded on four tracks. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. In a lot of ways, I kind of look at it's all too much as being George's all you need is love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree it's, with that. Yeah. It's, it's kind yeah, of, it's probably, got that, probably. that universality to it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, definitely uh, feel that way. And Old Brown Shoe, that's a song that I just appreciate so much more now than ever before because the song really builds. It mm-hmm. really kicks butt, you know, and um, mm-hmm. I especially love the version that Gary Brooker did at uh, the concert for George. Yes. It's, just, it's just a great rocker overall. And that could have been, I don't know, maybe you guys would disagree with me. I think that that could have been an A-side. Yeah, it could have been. You, one other thing that just struck me now, I don't know exactly what they did to his vocal 
But I just always liked, and I couldn't, don't ask me why, I just always liked George's vocal on that, the way it's mixed. Mm. Seems to be a little bit in the background, a little under everything else. Just It just struck a chord with me. Right. Really? Well, I think I around that time, I think uh, several of his vocals from that period are kind of undermixed. You know, long, long, long is certainly an example of that, mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, his, his vocal is certainly not out front. Uh, you know, I don't know whether that was his, his wish or George Martin or whoever. But it's it is interesting that, if, that there's a few songs from that time where his vocal is not really out front in the way that uh, certainly the you know the Lennon and McCartney vocals are. Right, right. Sometimes I think that long, long, long it starts off so soft. Yeah. And that was that was done intentionally to follow the loudness of Helter Skelter. Yes. Like that was yeah. done intentionally as a contrast of the two. Mm-hmm. So. Mm. Um, yeah, and and George's vocals obviously were very soft in the very beginning to match that. So right. See, I I, I think I just have to agree, disagree with you, Darren. I think I wished his vocals had been mixed up a little more on that song. Um, I I I think it would have sounded better. Oh, myself. so you okay? So that does yeah. I don't know. There's just something about, and I couldn't really tell you what I hear and what appeals to me about it. It just appealed to me, but I can totally understand that being. To someone else thinking, oh, were they paying attention when they mixed this? I, well, you know what it what it does what it does for me is it it creates um, a feeling, and I'm maybe I'm interpreting too much here, but inter- uh, creating the feeling that it's a lesser song. It doesn't really give it the respect it deserves because I think it's I agree with you. It's a hell of a rocker, and I love the uh, you know the slide guitar and all that. I, I think mm-hmm. that's. That's one thing I've always wanted to be able to. That's why, you know, I mean, several George songs I would love to be able to pl- actually play, and that's one of them <laughs> because it's just, it just sounds so good. And that when he does the slide guitar with the, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just, I mean, the power behind that slide is just fantastic. And uh, so, you know, and his solo on that too. As we're talking <laughs> about it, I'm playing it in my head. Yeah, and, 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 and his solo is simple but so powerful. Mm-hmm. Right, an old brown right. shoe. Now mm-hmm. somebody here, somebody's going to tell me that was Ringo playing lead guitar on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Completely throwing it off. Here. <laughs> there we go. So there's my three. Okay. And, he, and, and Al just mentioned long, 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 and again, I thought, oh, I might have considered that for mine had I thought of it. Mm. But, yeah, that's, that's certainly definitely. underappreciated. Yeah. Okay, how, who wants to be next? How about Steve? Okay, I will. Let's see. I'll I'll go with the probably the the least deep song first, and I'll go to the other ones. But uh, the it was actually the last one I picked. Is uh, you really got a hold on me because it is really one of their best covers of all the covers they did, and in, in the and the reason I I came to that conclusion was when I heard the. Um, the Supremes a bit of Liverpool album and the Supremes picked that song, put that song on there as one of the, because that whole song, whole album, if you're familiar with it is a bunch of, you know, British invasion songs. Mm-hmm. And although that's a Smokey Robinson song, they put it on there because the Beatles did it and the Beatles did a great version. And the Supremes version is also really, really good, but it really shows you how much Motown really respected that version of the, that they did. And, um, you know, I think we all tend to kind of, you know, pass it by and let it go. And I think that's a, that's really one hell of a cover that they did there. So that's my, that's my first pick. The second one is Christmas time is here again. <laughs> and I, I've always marveled at the fact that, um, they were Lennon and McCartney took the Lennon and McCartney formula and were able to create a, a wonderful Christmas song. And it's, it's like the only original on any of the Christmas records, but they were able to pick it, pick up this, you know, make the song. And it's, it's just absolutely fantastic. I mean, you, you would think 
it's i mean it could have fit in any beatles album and of course they didn't put it on a beatles album until you know and, well they didn't put they really i don't i can't remember if they put it on the anthology i know it was on one of the singles. it was on one of the singles yeah right but um i mean i that thing always stuck out and i remember looking for the bootlegs and the long version and you know the the tra- the only Vo- the uh, song only version where it's just them singing and there's none of the the stuff over it i mean i i love that song i think that's a great song it's just a uh i think it's a it's a it's a really a masterpiece and, and it just really in in shows you the genius of lennon and mccartney at that time that they could make a christmas song like that out of, with their formula and do such a great job so and then the third one is actually a combination of two, and I kind of cheated on this one. Um, Free as a Bird and Real Love. Mm. And I've talked about this before, that I think there was, uh, I remember, you know, sitting there that night watching the first anthology, and um, I'm not, not ashamed to say it, um, my eyes were wet after me, hearing Free as a Bird. Me too. Me And, and mm. you know, and I think that song, not only was it a great song, the video was stunning. Sure. And, I mean, the the way mm-hmm. that they crafted that video with all the clues, they, I mean, they knew what they were doing. They knew who was going to see it. They knew, you know, that was that was a work of love right there. But uh, that song, both of those songs, Free as a Bird and Real Love, were, um, you know, were really kind of um, therapy for them and for us. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I, I've really, and, and I don't think, and I've heard people say they're not part of the Beatles canon because it came later. And I really have to say, you know, I really don't think that's true. I mean, they did such a, a great job with those demos and I'm only sorry that now and then couldn't, it hasn't come out. And I hope at some point they decide to put that out. But I mean, I think they did a fantastic job, and uh, it was—it's absolutely fantastic. So, but if you I, have to pick one, which one would it be? If I have to pick one, obviously it's going to be "Free as a Bird" because okay. it was the first. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm going to confess here that when I interviewed Yoko many years ago, I kind of went out of my role as a journalist and I said, you know, I have to really thank you on behalf of the fans, and she was very touched by that. And so, um, I, I mean, that was kind of a, a weird thing to say, yeah, but, uh, you know, I really, it, it, that song really, I think helped everybody. It was a big, it was a big, uh, help for everybody. So well said, well said. Mm-hmm. Mm. Here we go. Well, I, yeah. I, I would say I applaud you very much on uh, what you just said about free as a bird and real love. And, uh, you know, when you think about what Jeff Lynn had to work with, the end result was just incredible. It really was. <laughs> and I appreciate the fact, especially with Free as a Bird, they let... It's, it's the only song, with the exception of Shout, where you've got three lead vocals <laughs> from mm-hmm. a Beatle, um, although Shout had four, but that's the only one I could think of with three separate lead vocals, and they, they made sure George got, you know, a few lines in there, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought that was very touching. Um, that's a, that's yeah, a good point. I, 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 didn't, I didn't even think about that, but, yeah, that's, no, that's a good point. But uh, Jeff Lynne worked wonders, and I think especially, for some reason, as much as I love Free as a Bird, I think Real Love seemed to flow a lot better Mm -hmm. for the Beatles, Mm. maybe because the song was more intact and more complete, whereas they had to do a little bit of patchwork on Free as a Bird and add more in the middle eight of the Mm -hmm. song. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, but Mm -hmm. they were both great. And and I really love uh, the lead guitar work from George on both those songs. You know, the one in real love, especially, it just, um, it just, it, it flows so naturally. It's so perfect for the song. And the one in Free as a Bird just grabs you in the gut, you know, what he plays mm-hmm. on, on lead there. So, but by the same token, I hate to say this, Steve, but I have to disagree completely with you with Christmas Time is Here Again. Only <laughs> because the fact that while, while I love it, um, I don't recognize it as a song because it's nothing more than a chorus that gets repeated over and over again. Uh, it's kind of frustrating for me that, you know, the Beatles could have just given us, if they gave us one complete Christmas song, 
I would have been very happy with it. But we have all these wonderful Christmas messages that are great documents of their time. And they're so much fun to listen to. And they really tell you from year to year where their minds were at. And I think that the, the messages reflect that. But, you know, at Christmas time is here again. If there were verses in the song, it would have been a more complete song. Instead, of, instead it's just the same chorus repeated over and over again. And then they inserted whatever they put in their messages in between that. Right. So it, I don't really look at it as a song. You know, it's just yeah. um, I wish I, that they I, had done something that was more complete. That's all. Well, they, they, had, they actually did because, uh, I, you know, I know we, we were trying to stick with release stuff here for, you know, uh, they actually did with the, with the bootleg versions. You know, there's those those bootleg versions that are more complete. But I was, I, I mean, I was actually kind of going on the chorus there because I, I love that chorus. Even though all they do is just repeat "Christmas time is here again" and Ringo goes, you know, Ringo drums and and everything. And uh, but I, I, you know, I I think that works just fine. And, and and unfortunately, I think because of the fact that it's on the Christmas discs, which Apple, if you're listening, would you release those damn things, please? <laughs> um, you know, um. I, you know, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic chorus. I mean, like I said, it's, you know, Lennon and McCartney genius right there. So now one thing uh-huh. though, uh, before, Go ahead, Go ahead, before, before we get the, the social media types, uh, you know, uh-huh. uh, going <laughs> at us, um, that actually is not the only, uh, original, uh, song on the Christmas, uh, the Christmas discs, because the the previous one, the one from '66, "Everywhere It's Christmas," that's oh, right, also right. kind of an original <laughs> yeah. song. Plus, also right. Paul did those two little ditties on the '68 and '69 uh, Christmas records. Mm-hmm. Actually, Paul did his own little Christmas album in '64 that got well, uh, yeah, right, the privately pressing that sure. uh, that got bootlegged, uh, you know, a few years ago. Right, and that's. But that, uh, I, as I recall, there's not anything original on that. Um, mm. Most of that is, is all stuff picked up uh, elsewhere. But I applaud Steve picking "Christmas Time Is Here Again" for, because it displays all the all the quirky Beatles charms. Now, granted, we're probably the only ones who would appreciate this stuff, but mm-hmm. it it. Um, it captures in ridiculously it's it's ridiculously si- simple but it just captures that beetle charm that you would hear in something like wild honey pie uh mm-hmm. off the wall nonsensical you think you could do it the same way uh well try i mean i mean it, even even when they were kind of maybe just throwing something up against the wall nobody threw things up against the wall better than the beetles did and uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I love when, you know, I never get tired of it when the holidays roll around and playing, pulling out my uh, my bootleg CD and, and, and hearing their mm-hmm. the full the full version of it just because it's so much fun. Mm-hmm. And I love that Ringo recorded it, which helped for I Want to Be Santa Claus, which kind of mm-hmm. helped legitimize it a bit in the Beatles canon, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I think the I Smithereens love, did, I, too, didn't they? I think they did. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yep. They did, as a matter of fact. Uh, and it's funny that it took us, what, 45 years to find, for at least us, the American audience, to find out what O U T spells out <laughs> actually meant mm-hmm. when uh, what Queenie does it actually I, mean? When Queenie I was, uh, was released uh, on the, the new album. And Paul explained. You know, in the interviews, that it's that uh, uh, that O U T spells out is the you know one of the lines in that game in the game oh, Queenie, really? Queenie Eye. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And really, uh, it seemed like in every interview he talked about that. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, I thought I thought it was just one of his um, little compositional devices, um, which normally when he can't think of something, he'll count, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, oh, seven, more yeah. good children go to heaven or one, two, three, four, five, let's go for a drive. Yeah. Um, there, there are a number of instances of him counting. And I thought maybe he decided <laughs> to change it out to, you know, spelling. 
No, in fact, it, it was apparently uh, it's Queenie Eye is a street game, I guess, not unlike, uh, you know, here in America, Ring of Levio, things like that. And right. mm. the kind of the ultimate of a round of of Queenie Eye is uh, that the, the, the last person that has the ball says O-U-T spells out. So. Right. Mm. So right. it was, like I said, it took us what forty-five years here in America, at least, <laughs> to find out what on earth that meant. Mm-hmm. Now we need a major league baseball umpire <laughs> to do that. There you go. <laughs> at home plate. Oh, <laughs> you te- right. Jeez. So am I the only one here that doesn't recognize Christmas time is here again? You know, as something. I mean, I love the song because I love the charm of it. You mm-hmm. know, and it it worked really well on the Christmas messages, but. The fact that it's not, you know, in my mind, a complete song. And the other ones that you were talking about, Al, those aren't complete either. No. You know, those little... are real snippets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But to, you know, and they def- work well in that context. Right. But to defend Christmas Time is Here Again, it did. Uh, I mean, I, the fact that it was uh, picked to, I mean, to be used in heavily edited form as a B-side of uh, Free as a Bird, if, right, I believe? Not real mm-hmm. love. It was Free as a Bird. The B-side of Free as a Bird. Yeah. And then Ringo recorded it, I think, kind of uh, kind of makes it a little more valid mm-hmm. uh, to be to be, ch- to be picked. But see, I didn't, I, I have to admit, I didn't I, think I understand your point, Ken. You know, they're yeah. just... I, but, um, you know, I, the Beatles' own recording is, the, the one that's on the bootleg is like, what, six minutes long. They're doing that, mm-hmm. and even though it's just a chorus or a refrain, they're... They're doing it for a while, and they seem to be having fun doing that. And there's a certain charm to that, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, why don't we move on and hear Alan's choices? Okay. You'll be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, in, to, <laughs> I'm already I, – I think I can figure out. Uh, <laughs> reputation for being <laughs> – I bet you could. Um, the first one, of course, is Revolution Number 9. <laughs> you were counting on that, right? Um, yes, I was. And, you know, I, I, I really actually love Revolution Number no. 9. I, I don't think I'm the only one in the world who does. In fact, I do know one other person who does. He's um, a guy named Matt Marks, who is a composer and French horn player in a group called Alarm Will Sound. And Matt Marks actually did an orchestrated version of Revolution Number no. 9, which Alarm Will Sound, which is a, a new music orchestra, performs on occasion. Wow. Um, and, and yeah. And um, so I just recently ran into him when I was covering that um, new music festival out in San Francisco. He was one of the people running it. And I gave him a, a copy of the track of uh, the revolution, unedited version that revolution number nine is based on. What I've always really liked about revolution number nine or revolution nine, as it's actually called, is that, um, you know, it, you have to see it really as part of this trilogy of revolutions that John has. Now, the fact is, he didn't undoubtedly he didn't set out to make a trilogy of revolutions, but he ended up with a trilogy of revolutions that tell story, um, the story that begins with the acoustic slow kind of laconic revolution one um where he's kind of not sure whether when you talk about destruction you can count him out or in Mm. then the second one it gets much more intense he doesn't give that one a number i would say it's like should be really like revolution number five or something Mm. you know because things have really heated up it's very intense it's very electric it's kind of on the edge of danger there and that's revolution the flip side of the hey jude single and he already knows that when you talk about destruction, you can count them out. You get to revolution number nine, and that's the revolution. And if you listen to it with that in mind, and you listen to it as kind of a sound painting, it shows everything falling apart. It's, it, it shows, you know, it, it's, it's scary, really, as, uh, as, as Candy Leonard's interviewees told her about mm-hmm. a lot of the quirkier Beatles songs. Um, it, I mean, it, I think it's meant to be scary. It has that very dark atmosphere. It has these things that kind of don't make sense, but you can see being conversations of, you know, a, a society falling apart or, a, you know, someone in the background talking about all the dance moves. Um, mm. 
Yoko saying, you know, they become naked, you know, mm-hmm. just, just everything is, it's just so strange. But if you listen to it, uh, you, you hear it at a certain point, what sounds like, uh, I think they're pouring something, but on, on the recording, it sounds like a flame starting up. Mm -hmm. Um, If you listen to it with that, all that in mind and coming out of revolution one and revolution, um, it it kind of completes the picture of what John saw the revolution being because, you know, John was criticized for putting out revolution as a single because for people who really wanted a revolution, he was kind of standing aside and saying, you know, let me see the plan. I want to know what you have in mind because I think he was afraid of happening what you hear in Revolution 9. Apart from that, I just love it as a piece of electronic music. I mean, in my other job, you know, as a classical music critic, I listen to an awful lot of electronic music and a lot of it is not nearly as well made as this piece is. I always thought that um, EMI's classical line should release an album with that Carnival of Light and, and some of the other uh, experiments they did. Um, but anyway, so that's my first one. That was the hmm. B side of Carnival of Light you just heard. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so my second one, <laughs> assuming there's no uh, pushback here, is you know my name, look up the number. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. I just knew that was, <laughs> was going to be your second choice. I knew it. Okay. <laughs> you know, for similar reasons. I mean, it, we're looking for stuff that's underappreciated, and I certainly can't remember the last time I heard that on the radio. Um, I don't it. think I ever heard it on the radio during the Beatles era. You know, you, you should did, listen you to my show. I've okay. played it. Yay. <laughs> well, well, there you go. I like the fact that we got an alternate version on an anthology, although George insisted on editing it. But fortunately, all the stuff he edited was on the single. So people have been able to reconstruct the full version using both the single and the anthology version. Uh, Problem is, of course, that goes back and forth between stereo and mono because the Mm. single was only mono, Mm. but not for long. So it's I I don't find that that troubling. Um, I think, you know, what John has created there and and I say John, but I mean, they were all, all clearly very active participants in this. They created this picture of a very bizarre kind of lounge, you know, with a semi-jazz singer and all kinds of different beats going on and, uh, mm-hmm. and changes of meter and changes of tempo, changes of harmony, changes of song in a way. It's, it's, it's one of those sort of collage songs like A Day in the Life, you know, mm-hmm. you, you can see little bits of it having been composed at different times and stuck together and I remember the first time I when I got the let it be single home and played it I just thought it was hilarious you you know I I couldn't I couldn't imagine you know these are the guys who were putting out two minute singles only a few years earlier and uh, you know I want to hold your hand nothing nothing there's anything wrong with that and here they were doing this which was just so out there Um, I loved it and so my third choice, actually, I had two potential third choices. One that I didn't choose, but I'll just mention, would have been George is Not Guilty, which was an outtake from mm. the White Album, ended up in the anthology, so it counts. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the way it airs some of the um, backstage problems they were having um, in a very typically George way. But the one I really want to choose is what should have been the B side of, you know, my name, look up the number if John had his way and put it out as a single, Uh oh. which of Uh-oh. course was what's the new Mary Jane. <laughs> no, you thought I was going to say life with the lions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I was waiting for life. But I didn't. <laughs> But no, what's the new Mary Jane? Um, I have to say, I prefer the ones that came out on bootleg on that um, big 12-inch single years ago. Mm -hmm. I prefer that to the one that they put on the anthology. But I do think it's interesting that, you know, also on the Isher tapes, those demos that they made at George's house before going in to record the White Album, they did a demo of what's the new 
Mary Jane. So it's obviously not just some, you know, thing that happened in the studio one afternoon when they were high. It's a song that John wrote, had in mind what he wanted to do and um, did it. And, you know, and I, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting tune. It's um, I suppose if uh, uh, Christmas time is here again, isn't a song. What's the new Mary? Mary Jane probably isn't either, since its total lyric is "What a shame Mary Jane had a pain at the party." Um, no, there are, are you know I like verses. that. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. There are verses. Yeah, she liked to be married with Yeti. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she cooking such groovy spaghetti. How could I forget? Um, yeah. Okay, so there are. You're right. You're right. It's a much better song than Christmas Time is here again. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, again, was a kind of a fun song. I liked getting it as a bootleg. I was a little disappointed with the, the, the version or the mix on the anthology, but I, I enjoyed having it out there, really, as a, as a sort of finished song. So those are my three. You could kind mm -hmm. of say, particularly in the case of, of uh, You Know My Name and even What's the New Mary Jane, that they both come out of the, you know, kind of the satire boom that was very big in England at that time, and also mm -hmm. going all the way back to, you know, the influence that the Goon Shows had on, right. had on the Beatles, particularly on, on John Lennon. Because, in fact, um, You Know My Name is not all that different from what they were doing on the 1967 Christmas record, the one that has... Christmas time mm -hmm. here again, mm -hmm. you know, again, that, that sort of, uh, uh, very satirical tone, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's funny because they completed it, what, I guess, very shortly before the debut of Monty Python, which was obviously maybe mm -hmm. the, the most, uh, fully realized offshoot of the satire boom. So mm. it's all, you know, and since you mentioned that, since mm. you mentioned that, I mean, really, these these two songs, um, apart from the Christmas albums, are re really the only evidence we have of that side yes. of 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 them, which was a really important part of their background, that goons thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, very it, much. Was, it was why they got along with George Martin so instantly uh, because uh, he had produced very, them. Very true. Things. Now, as time goes on, you begin to realize how George Martin proved to be the the perfect producer for them in every sense of the word, given his background before the Beatles, not just with the goons, right. but doing uh, classical music, too. So, yeah. uh, I remember when uh, Let It Be came out, and like I mentioned before, I was five at the time of the breakup and had Let It Be when it was brand new. You know my name, look up the number, scared me something awful <laughs> because at really? five years old i had no idea what was going on and i was terrified huh. of playing that song i never played the you know i always avoided because i had this thing about when i play my singles when i was a little kid i'd always listen to the b-side mm -hmm. didn't happen with let it be until i got a little older and uh now i always would you know i i get a kick out of the few times i'll pull it out and play it on wfuv wondering what is the audience thinking right now <laughs> but uh, that's a great pick and what was your reaction to revolution nine when that when you first heard that i was i think i think i got the white album in 76 when i was 11 mm -hmm. and i think i already was prepared i had heard about this song you know and uh I was fascinated, always have been fascinated by it. Uh, when I'm in, uh, when I'm playing the White Album and um, uh, there are people with an earshot, I'll sometimes spare them and skip it. Uh, <laughs> but when I'm listening to it on my own, uh, I'm always kind of trying to dissect it, looking for something different that I haven't heard the first thousand times I listened to it. <laughs> In fact, it's interesting. Great picks. It's interesting that the Fab Faux, when they yeah. when they do yeah. their the full <laughs> albums, they will do on stage. Will do Revolution Nine. So I wonder well, how they pull that they, off, though. Um, you know, with a lot of tape uh, loops and things. Mm. You know, a lot of maybe not tape loops, but you know, synthesizer tricks. <laughs> yeah. You know, now that it's out there, that full tape 
take of take 20 of revolution one where you know the the last several minutes of which becomes the yes. basis of revolution number nine mm-hmm. that's something that they really ought to release in in some form because um you get a bit of insight into you know what actually was going on at the end of that take in the studio i mean the part where Yoko is saying you be, they become naked is is actually in the original take. It wasn't a, a later edition. Um, so it's sort of interesting to to hear all that. And and if they ever do another anthology or uh, or rarities collection, I hope they include that hmm. and Carnival wow. Light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, I love the fact that you chose Revolution Number Nine there, Alan, because uh, I, I look at it as being a very moody piece. And it's very fascinating to listen to, especially with headphones on. But I do remember as a little kid listening, and, and it really did scare me, especially the flames like you were referring to, mm-hmm. and hearing, uh, mm-hmm. take this, brother, may it serve you well, and not knowing what all this meant. You know, you kind of felt like mm-hmm. an apocalypse was happening or something, as, or about to happen. And I think as, that was the idea. Yeah, yeah. And, and also especially since that was used as one of the uh, elements of the whole Paul is dead uh, phenomenon right for want of a better word el dorado yes (laughs) (laughs) all right so i guess that leaves me with my top three Mm -hmm. all right well for me the top two were very easily but there could have been like 20 songs that ranked number three for me so um i very randomly picked for my number three song i'll be back I think I'll Be Back is one of the best of the songs of 1964. It's got a great melody and a great hook to it. And I love the fact that there was a little bit more work put behind it because apart from having the verses and then what was, um, I guess it would be either the bridge or the middle eight, the uh, I love you so, I'm the one who wants you. But then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you got John singing, I thought that you would realize that part. So it's it's got mm-hmm. all these different sections in it. So, you know, they mm-hmm. packed into uh, two, two and a half minutes, you know, a lot of work into that one song. Apart from the fact that it's a, another great harmony song, like so many songs in the Beatles canon. But, um, you know, it's just a wonderful song that I don't think has ever been given its due. I think people like it, but it's never been placed way up there, you know, in uh, of all the, the Beatles songs, all the great Beatles songs that they've put out. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, I kind of look at this. I don't think there's any song in the Beatles catalog that should be considered obscure. To me, knowing the Beatles catalog is like learning the alphabet. You know, there's no letter that you should leave out. So, um, but that being said, in every artist catalog, there's always their most well-known songs and their lesser-known songs, no matter who you're talking about. But, um, you know, I also wanted to put Yes, It Is in there as my third choice, but that would probably be kind of equal yeah. with, um, with I'll Be Back. Mm. My number two song, without a doubt, is a song that I appreciate so much more now than I ever have, and that's Julia. I think Julia is an absolute masterpiece. It's a beautiful song, and I think that um, the fact that it's just John and an acoustic guitar, it couldn't have been done any better. I love the soft vocal delivery of John's voice in there, which matched the song completely. Lyrically, it's just an absolutely stunning song. It flows together so well. Um, and I do love the fact that even though the Beatles, the Beatles didn't invent this, but the melody of the song, it's the same note for quite a while. You know, half of what I say is meaningless, but I say it just to reach you, Julia. Mm. Then it drops. Mm. But for a long time, it's on that same one note. But there are chords, different chords being played while the same note is being sung. So I, I think that's kind of a brilliant thing that the Beatles did in that song. But, um, you know, as I've said many times, um, there's two different issues when you, come, when you discuss the Beatles. One is the songs, then there's, their, there's the recordings. And even though the four Beatles brought so much to their recordings in so many instances, you've got many cases, especially on the White Album, where you've got just one Beatle or two Beatles. And that's all that was really necessary. Just like, you know, Blackbird is perfect the way it is, Paul on acoustic guitar. Julia is perfect the way it is, just John and acoustic guitar. So, um, you know, I really can't even picture that song with a band accompaniment because it's so perfect just the way that it was presented with John and acoustic. You know, so, um, and the sentiment in that song and, and combining his thoughts about his mother, mixing that with Yoko is perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, I really look at Julia as being 
an undersung masterpiece in the Beatles catalog. And uh, so that's why I picked that as number two. And my number one song is Within You Without You. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because of the fact that I think that there's so much going on in that song. It was so way ahead of its time lyrically mm -hmm. for all the Eastern philosophy that was put in there. And the mere fact that, you know, it's, you could say this about a lot of songs that the Beatles recorded, that they were so young when they did this. Yes. The fact that, that George absorbed Eastern philosophy and Eastern culture so well and mm -hmm. expressed that lyrically in this song. And it was just way ahead of its time. I mean, there's so many people, even still to this day, that when they play Sgt. Pepper, they tell me they skip Within You Without You. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a five minute song and there's so much going on in it. And especially and maybe, Alan, you can you can fill us in on this, because I don't know if this is the very first time when Eastern in, uh, Eastern instruments were mixed with the Western string instruments. And it was like a perfect marriage of the two of them. I mean, I can only imagine um, the amount of work that was put together by George Martin and with George Harrison looking over how the two of them were just combined together the way that they were because it was just so absolutely brilliant, you know, and uh, you mix that with the lyrics of the song, you know, it was just so, it's a, a stunning piece of work that every time I listen to it now, I can't believe George Harrison was 23 years old writing mm -hmm. this, you know, and um, you talk about being a fly on the wall on Beatles sessions and there's so many we'd love to have been a part of, but just to witness this, to see how this all came together, the marriage of the, the different stringed instruments, you know, it's just um, something that really fascinates me. And I'd love to know how much George Harrison in particular, not just with Within You, Without You, but with all the Indian stuff that he did, how involved he really was with the arrangements of everything. But um, maybe you can fill us in, Alan, on what I was just saying. Um, well, it it. It probably wasn't the first to combine Indian and Western string instruments. Um, in 1965, 66, Ravi Shankar did a soundtrack for a movie called Chappaqua that used both Western orchestras and Indian instruments. And as an interesting footnote, one of the young orchestrators helping him work on it was Philip Glass, um, uh -huh. who subsequently became a very famous composer. Sure. Um, also, um, Shankar did other things possibly before that. I mean, he was very aware of Western orchestras and uh, and was writing ballets for for the West and that kind of thing. And I think he combined them too. But but certainly for rock listeners, none of us would have heard anything like that before. I'm trying to and remember think, the uh, uh, the Butterfield Blues Band, the East West album. When when did that come mm -hmm. out? That was 66, I think. Like okay, 60. so that uh, that would precede that. I think it mm, was 66. Okay. Did that have an orchestra? No. Mm. Interesting. So, um, yeah. But, you know, George, George Martin's string score for that was just beautiful. Oh, uh, yeah. Especially given that um, he was actually pretty critical of it. If you, if you read some of his, uh, you know, he's written three or four memoirs, and he, and he talks about... Uh, within you, without you, and and he says that he basically didn't like it, and yet he wrote this masterly score, um, <laughs> which we got to hear really much better in the anthology version without yes. the vocal. It's, it's mm -hmm. just beautiful listening to the yeah. interplay of of all the instruments. Right. We were talking about George. Someone I think Ken mentioned George Martin and, yeah. and him being the perfect producer for them, which I think is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But it's also good that the Beatles had a veto. <laughs> Um, over his ideas, because I think if it was up to him, he, even though he wrote that score, he wouldn't have put Within You, Without You on Pepper. And he definitely wouldn't have put Revolution Number no. 9 on the White Album. He referred to it once as Scribble. So, <laughs> yeah. Did George Martin uh, pref wish the Beatles uh, had kind of whittled the White Album down to be one solid single album? He's, he says that in the yeah, anthology, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they and they so you remember were... there was that great sequence, the great sequence where he he talks about yeah I think it it would have been a fine single album, and Paul says <laughs> yeah I'm getting tired of hearing people say the white album <laughs> single album it's the white album it's the Beatles shut right. up <laughs> right? just like that you know Ken that was I was thinking moment. about what you were saying about <laughs> Julia. 
Uh, uh-huh. That opening line, uh, that's uh, it's an interesting line to open a song. There's no, first of all, there's no uh, acoustic or, uh, or uh, instrumental beginning to the song. It starts right out where he declares mm-hmm. half of what I say is meaningless. Right. Mm-hmm. That says a lot. That's just mm-hmm. a powerful line uh, to open up this particular song. And uh, I don't think anyone could have, re- I mean, just, <laughs> it's just a, incredible way to open up a song like that from a songwriter like that to make that kind of declaration right and if i remember correctly mm-hmm. if i remember my uh mark lewis and uh, beatles recording sessions book uh, correctly that was the last track recorded for the white album and it was recorded in the wee hours of the morning of the basically the last day that they were able to uh, uh you know, complete the album and get it out, you know, for the, you know, the, the Christmas market. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well, these are all great choices that yeah, all of us have come up with. <laughs> that puts a wrap on this show. And uh, if any of you would like to get in touch with us, we have an email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. If you would like to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. Please make sure you check out my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, Steve, they can do so how? Uh, Beatlesexaminer at gmail.com, and I'm also all over Facebook. Al, how about you? Uh, Same thing, my Facebook page and uh, also my Twitter, uh, asus49. And I still have the 1965 the 365 reasons why 1965 is the single greatest year in the history of rock and roll. I still have that going every day. Have you got those all worked out? (laughs) Um, actually, no, actually, I don't know until that morning what I'm going to, what I'm going to use. No, it's it's very ad lib. Okay. And it's not in any order either. It's just simply, you know, I mean, it's chronologically it's, it's in order. It's, you know, basically what was, you know, what was a hit at this at this point uh, using basically the New York centric uh, charts from WABC and WMCA. But until uh, until I actually peruse the chart, I don't know what I'm going to use that particular day, which kind of makes I, it, you know, a little bit of a, a little bit of a challenge, but also kind of neat. Living on the edge. Rediscovery. Yes. Yes, exactly. Alan, how about you? Okay, well, I'm on Facebook as either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and um, on Twitter, at Cozen. So, easy to find. And Darren? Uh, You could go to my Facebook page, which is Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. That's uh, the page that I like people to join me at. And uh, I can be heard on WFUV, 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, and uh, also on weekends at our FUV Music channel, which is 90.7 FM HD2, or uh, you could stream it at WFUV.org um, uh, on 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., and again, 6 p. to 9 p. Saturday and Sunday, and my email address is my name, Darren DeVivo at WFUV. Dot org. Okay, and I failed to mention that we have our own Facebook page here for this show, for things we said today. And I have my own, too, under Ken Michaels. All right, so this has been great. Some really good uh, suggestions here. Some great choices overall from everybody. And we love your feedback, too, all of you listening to our show. So once again, our email address is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. This has been great. Darren, thanks so much for joining us again. I'm uh, I'm glad I passed the audition last week and that you guys asked me <laughs> back for today. And I you hope to be with... back again soon. Uh, you definitely will. All right. Okay. So, for things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels, being joined by Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and Darren DeVivo. Thanking you all for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.